Thank you very much, Thomas. Um, so, uh, as a technology company such as Warwick Control, um, we work mostly in CAN, FlexRay, LIN, and also now Ethernet systems with a very much automotive focus. So, for a company like us, it was interesting to actually look at the, uh, you know, where CANFD could go in terms of uh, another technology such as FlexRay. So, basically, this uh, presentation will cover all of this. I'll just go through the main bits here. So, first of all, in this presentation, I'm going to introduce FlexRay and then compare the uh, key features of CANFD. I think you'll probably see lots of repetition today, so I apologise for that because we've actually had maybe uh, three other uh, CANFD presentations at this point already. But um, I'll, I'll discuss the uh, key features, um, things like bandwidth comparisons, uh, maybe with a slightly different slant on these things, um, control loop timing, um, some indicators on cost, and then hopefully I'll um, encourage you to agree with my conclusion, maybe where these two technologies sit in the, in the market for um, automotive. So the, the first thing to uh, consider is uh, high-speed networking. So we know for many years that, uh, especially for higher-end automotive applications, uh, CAN has been reaching its limitation. So um, certainly on the, the higher-end um, manufacturers, they've uh, adopted a faster network, such as FlexRay. Now, there's a certain number of um, key benefits for a technology such as FlexRay. Um, but it's not just FlexRay that provides the benefits. A faster network will provide um, similar benefits. If you look at the um, electrical architecture on a system basis, so what I mean by that is if we look at, uh, you know, maybe many different networks and how they influence each other, and, uh, you know, a higher speed network such as FlexRay can uh, replace several lower speed networks, for example, CAN in this case. Uh, that in turn reduces the number of ECUs which are required to gateway information between the different uh, networks. This can re uh, reduce the amount of wiring in the vehicle, um, reduces the um, weight again, you know, because you're reducing ECUs, reducing uh, wiring, and uh, reduces the uh, design complexity. And I've got a slide which probably uh, explains the design complexity in... So I'm suffering with uh, little things on the Apple here, but I'll be okay. There we go. So uh, if you take um, a typical example with CAN, then we'd consider um, something such as vehicle speed. So what we've got here is a diagram showing a uh, three-bus um, CAN, well, three CAN system. So something like uh, a vehicle speed would probably initially come from an ECU such as a braking system. So there'd be, uh, you see, we've got wheel speed sensors coming from each of the wheels and uh, going on the chassis CAN bus system um, as, a, as a CAN signal. That would also probably be required for um, powertrain controls. So, you know, vehicle speed is an interesting signal for that. So it has to go across the gateway into the powertrain control system. But also, you know, as you know, um, it, you know, your, your car stereo will also require something like vehicle speed to um, adjust the volume control. So for a simple signal like this, you have to decide how you're going to get it across the system. You have to design the, uh, the schedule for this uh, particular signal. So a faster network, if you replace this with a single network, you can get rid of a lot of that kind of uh, complexity straight away. Now, to get into, I mean, there's probably not too much spoken about FlexRay today. It's been mentioned, but uh, maybe some people don't know um, too much about FlexRay, being as this is the CAN conference. But uh, I'll give you some, uh, some, some, some base information here, I guess. Uh, basically, uh, it's, it's a time-triggered protocol, and uh, its uh, scheduling methodology is referred to as TDMA, which you see sometimes referred to as time division media access uh, or time division multiple access. But the key thing is you have an uh, exclusive window of time with which an ECU can transmit a message which might contain, for example, you know, wheel speed information. So we've got uh, you know, a number of slots or windows going across the top there, and then you get a number of cycles. And by, by this way, the whole um, uh, communication schedule is multiplexed this way. So typically, you'd go across the top, you know, message one, message two, message four, message five, message six, and then down to the next row, and you execute the, the communication schedule, uh, and then once you run out, you go back to the beginning again. Of course, it's a bit more 
complex than that in the real world with Flexray, because Flexray is being designed with two communication channels, so they're referred to as um, A and B there. And the, uh, the schedule is broken into um, two segments. So the first segment is referred to as the static segment, which you can see on the uh, top left over there. And uh, this is pretty much fixed at design time. So there's no flexibility to change of it really there. And the second segment, which is uh, kind of a, a time-triggered uh, approach to um, scheduling, but it's more what they refer to as mini-slotting. And this is the dynamic segment, and this is used for uh, dynamically changing data, and I'll mention this in a minute in um, respect to a uh, real application of FlexRain. Um, the next thing to consider is really the, um, the latency characteristic between CAN and a time-trigger network such as FlexRay. So um, if you have a contention-based network, such as uh, controlling networks, essentially you'll have a, a situation whereby if you design the system badly, then the bus load will start going up. Uh, or as the bus load starts going up, you'll find certain messages um, start getting um, start of access to the network. With FlexRay, because, especially with the um, static segment, because there's an exclusive window of time, you get this kind of, uh, kind of flat characteristic which means it's deterministic, which is uh, good for safety systems. Now, we get onto a, a real application of FlexRay here. Now, the first, um, some of you will notice, certainly I can see many automotive colleagues here, the first uh, production application of uh, FlexRay was with the, um, the SUV from BMW, which is the X5. And this is um, a representation of the architecture used and uh, it was a chassis control system, which they uh, refer to as adaptive drive, and uh, it consisted of five ECUs. So basically it had um, one ECU at each quadrant of the vehicles, you know, front left, front right, rear left, rear right, and a management unit. <coughs> and uh, a single channel was used. So rather than using the two channels, a single channel was used. If we get on to the communication schedule, this is a representation of how the um, schedule is broken down. Now, we've got um, the schedule was uh, running at 10 megabits per second uh, on a single channel. Um, and by the way, FlexRay can go at um, three main speeds, 2.5 2 meg and 5 meg as well, but they've gone for the faster one. And you can see we've got a five millisecond communication cycle. So the static segment is three milliseconds, whereby you have the exclusive uh, control system messages in there. And in the dynamic segment, you can see you've got uh, a two millisecond slot there, which we use for event triggered messages, or um, network management, diagnostics, such as would be used by, um, um, you know, in service by garages or for end of line uh, vehicle production, um, flash download, and back to XCP. Um, but a key point about this, and this is one of the motivators for something like KenFD, is 60% of the bandwidth cannot be used during flashing because you know you've got this this setup here. So you know you can only use this two milliseconds uh, dynamic segment. Then moving on to uh, another sort of uh, step on from uh, the X5. This is basically the architecture for the 5 Series BMW. So basically BMW have, have adopted this technology quite significantly. And you can see there we've got uh, a lot of CAM, we've got um, MOS, and we've got uh, we have FlexRay here with um, more ECUs adopted. You know, maybe it's one, two, three, four, nine, 10 or 12 ECUs there, so it's uh, quite a big difference. Now, this is um, really my summary of um, FlexRay adoption, and you know, it's within the automotive industry and wider. I'm sure some people maybe could probably feed back to this to a certain degree, but as we see it at Warwick Control, it seems to be um, a, a very much um, driven by the German automotive manufacturers at the moment. So we, we see it appearing in uh, sort of BMW type companies, um, VW Audi Group companies seem to be adopting it. Um, heard this morning that uh, Daimler are adopting it. I also know um, from other projects we've been involved in that um, we believe that uh, there is uh, another European manufacturer I cannot say, of course, who is seriously considering FlexRay in a sort of autosar format. Um, I understand that might be a Japanese manufacturer about to adopt the technology. There's also one in the UK 
um, partially due to uh, tie-up with um, a German manufacturer. Uh, also, in aerospace, there's been uh, various re research projects on Flexray, but as far as I know, there's um, no real adoption at this stage in, in a sort of production system. And also, we've um, been involved in the past with a uh, robotic system as well. So they're using you know, high-integrity, um, fast robotic controls using Flexway. <coughs> so you'll basically, uh, you can see some of the, the benefits there and some of the um, disadvantages of Flexway. I mean, can FD make sense to sort of close the gap on Flexway? Um, certainly on the ECU um, flashing side, but also um, we're interested in, you know, maybe can can CANFD actually be used in control systems? So there's other parts of this uh, presentation and we start looking at its potential in terms of bandwidth generally. So you'll, you'll see uh, a, uh, a slide like this probably many times in the next two days, I think. And uh, you see it many times already. And I think this is actually courtesy of uh, Florian, actually, I think, um, who lent us some uh, information last year. But uh, as you know, the, the key thing about CANFD, and I won't uh, labour this, the main thing is you're, you're speeding up the, uh, the data phase so you can get uh, uh, shortened data in there. And, and the benefits are clear. You know, you can increase the uh, data phase um, bit rate and you get uh, uh, an average bit rate which is equivalent to many times that of CAN. So, sort of... Uh, if we look at CAN, CANFD and Flexray at a top level, I won't go through all the uh, different parts here, this is really for reference and it's also in the paper, but um, th these are the main um, features between the uh, different protocols. I mean, the key thing is we've got um, the data phase there with CANFD, I mean, there really is, well, the limitation there, I think, is a, a point of discussion between uh, different presentations today, so I'll leave that for you, Bob. I've actually got this in an old slide, it's actually down to 8 megabits per second. But um, that's the uh, figure I'm using for the rest of the analysis in this presentation. <coughs> so, for the next part, what I've done here is looked at uh, actual data throughput and tried to put um, uh, Flexray and uh, CAN and CANFD on the same axis. Now, Flexray has a data payload of up to 254 bytes. However, the very first applications only used eight bytes of data, and however, that's now increasing, of course. But um, I think, as maybe I think Peter mentioned earlier, I think I think they're only going up to 48 bytes in uh, current applications. But uh, for this analysis here, I've actually assumed uh, that we can actually uh, load, you know, we can load up the um, CANFD network. I think we looked at the worst case. Um, of bit stuffing and 11-bit identifiers. And uh, what you can see here is um, in the pink here, this is uh, CAN as it's probably run on many vehicles. So it's running at 500 kilobits per second, which is pretty standard for most powertrain and chassis networks. They tend not to run at me one megabit for various EMC type reasons. Then uh, Across the top, there's a dotted um, flat line, which is uh, Flexray. That's here. And that's running at uh, two and a half megabit per second. So it's not really the, the full capacity of Flexray, but it's looking at the, the bottom end capacity of Flexray. And then we've got um, a yellow line, which is um, CANFD with its um, arbitration phase at one megabit. And we've got CANFD in the blue with its arbitration phase at 500 megabit, which is arguably the more sort of realistic uh, case on that side. And then across the bottom, we've got the uh, data phase increase in uh, bits per second. And the key thing there, you can see it's kind of um, straddling either side of the sort of low end flex rate side. So I think one of the key things to, uh, to see here, I'm sorry, I should point out by the way on the Y axis, that it uh, is uh, you know, the bytes per second data throughput rather than bits per second. So we're looking at how much information we can get through there. But um, I think what we can see here, in terms of um, data throughput with an 8 bytes message, we can basically sort of get in the region of the uh, 2.5 um, megabit per second flex rate. Now, I haven't actually increased it with the 64 bit, sorry, bytes payload, but we've got the 8 byte there. 
So we've looked at uh, factors impacting upon cost. Now, cost is an interesting sort of concept when you look at um, these different networks. And there's, there's multiple factors, and I'm sure some of you work in this technology area probably appreciate some of these, but there's things like um, IP gates, so like basically the, 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 the size of the silicon that's actually taken up by a uh, technology has an impact on cost. RAM is a, a fairly significant one there. Um, development tools, that could be availability, competition and market. Um, setting up work, I mean Flexray certainly has many more parameters to set up compared to uh, such as can and can be more tricky um, to deal with and, and even with modern vehicles, if I work on uh, a new platform, you know, customer vehicle these days, you can still turn up and they'll wire the can high and can low around the wrong way, even though can has been successfully exploited for 20 years. So I think Flexway has a lot more sort of a challenge on that side. And the next part is training of staff. Now, that can is a, a very well-known technology. There's a lot of expertise in the automotive industry. Uh, comparatively, uh, I think Flexway has um, very little knowledge. Um, you know, there's probably some key people here I can sort of see who are real experts in, in Flexway, but um, I, th I think um, the knowledge of it's um, quite sparse. Um, new electrical signalling can bring its challenges and uh, how that compares between different technologies. Uh, flexibility of architecture, another factor of impact on cost, number of wires. And quality of wires, which um, can affect the bit error rate. So, to uh, further um, compare where the cost sits, what I found really useful is our, our colleagues from Bosch actually have got um, IP, which you can actually get the information from the web very nicely. And it allows us to compare the technology very nicely um, with the different uh, cores they've got there. And uh, you can look at the number of gates for the different um, IP cores available and the message RAM and how this works. And there's certainly previous studies that show that um, there's certainly a key indicator on how, you know, this actually, it's not the only factors affecting cost, but it certainly is a, a significant factor. So you've got the um, flex rate at the top there, and you've got uh, various CAN recommendations with um, CANFD and TTCAN towards the bottom there. And it's probably better to look at in a graphical form. And that sort of gives you a, re a fairly good representation. But um, it's probably not surprising that, you know, you, you You've got CAN towards the bottom end, which um, has fewer gates and uh, lower requirement for message RAM. And when you go up to Flexray, not surprisingly, you know, it's seen as the more sophisticated technology, so it has more gates and higher RAM. And you've got uh, the likes of CAN FD sits in the middle there, so that's an interesting indicator. Now, um, this is probably a slide you've probably seen. Uh, well, probably in many different places in different uh, variations for the last 12, 13 years, I think. I think it originally came from the Lin Consortium when they're trying to compare how Lin fitted it. And we've kind of, um, a warrior control sort of adapted this with new information as time goes on. So we've now got up to different versions of MOST on there and uh, gigabit um, Ethernet. But we're trying to sort of uh, show where the relative cost goes in there. But I think it's really... Um, it can be up for major discussion, really, because if you look at, um, at some papers you know, published by BMW on Flexray, they'll say, actually, if you look at the system cost, it's actually uh, much lower. So if you look at silicon cost, Flexray might be more expensive. But if you look at uh, the actual you know, system cost with the reduction of wires and gateways, it would be a major saving. So... Where's it all going to fit into the, to the future? I mean, I think basically it's clear now that um, we're really on a, uh, a kind of multi-network type system. I, I mean, a colleague of mine went to an Ethernet conference recently, and uh, they were saying Ethernet's going to take over the world for, for automotive. But I think for you know cost reasons, I think you'll we'll probably find the appropriate technology will be in the appropriate area. So you've got things like Lin down on the uh, real, you know, sort of low-end body control ends. I think CAN and CANFD will become one and have its applications in a lot of these areas, powertrain potentially. Flexway will have its place. I'm thinking you're seeing in the future you're going to see a lot more Ethernet, um, probably replacing MOST, I think. 
Um, probably as a backbone, infotainment, um, radar systems, a lot of vision systems, you know, lane departure warning systems. There's lots of um, high-end uh, sort of DAS systems appearing now, and I think they need the bandwidth. So I think you can see uh, a lot more of that appear in the future. So, conclusion. Impact of uh, CANFD on FlexRay. So, I think CANFD is probably a working title at the moment, and I think as it uh, evolves, it'll just be a part of CAN eventually. It'll be a, a part of the uh, CAN standard. And uh, the, the CANFD name and logo will be sort of a, a thing of the past, and it'll be uh, adopted that way, I think. I think both have their place as a part of the automotive network technology mix. Uh, Flexray is a lot faster than CANFD. Um, it also has certain safety features built in. Um, Flexray's growth is not yet guaranteed, I don't think. It's, um, it's creeping in there. It's, um, it's, it's very popular within German manufacturers. And uh, I think maybe some companies are being uh, quite conservative at the moment. There's risk considerations, higher cost of tools, personal training, uh, new technology risks generally, and the complexity of the protocol, this might, um, this might slow down flex rate to some degree. Um, I think CANFD have, could have the potential to have an effect on the uh, flex rate adoption. I mean, certainly we could argue about the, uh, the data phase and what uh, potential is in there, but um, it can certainly be the equivalent of a low-end uh, FlexRay network, which might be enough to support a next-generation automotive platform, but that depends on the requirements of the actual uh, vehicle manufacturer. Um, can it delay or even uh, stop FlexRay? I don't know. I mean, Ethernet is uh, something that's been um, discussed significantly for control systems and infotainment and uh, vision, so watch this space. So uh, thank you for your attention. That's, that's over for me. Thank <laughs> you.